I'm, uh, I guess I'm hard to believe, but I don't have enough to talk about. So I think what we should do is just go into our first talk. Um, I know Jackie uh, McDonald Gibson is already here. And so um, I think, it, Yuki, does that work for you? Now can you see it? That looks right. So okay. you can take me off the screen, Hideyuki, where we'll let uh, Jackie go. Okay, terrific. Well, I am so honored to be invited to speak with all of you today. Um, I am Jackie McDonald Gibson. I have a PhD trained in civil and environmental engineering and also have a PhD in public policy. And right now I am chair of the Department of Environmental Health at Indiana University in Bloomington. But actually, um, Later this summer, I'm going to be moving to North Carolina State University to um, resume work uh, in a civil and environmental engineering department as head of the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. And you'll see that the, the work I'm presenting today really is um, in North Carolina because I, I spent 12 years at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill previously. On Here is a picture of one of my former graduate students, Frank Stillo, um, who's now a consultant for Geosyntech, um, and one of our study participants in the background. So I'm going to tell you the title of my talk. My talk's all about um, the situation where reliance on private well water isn't a matter of geography. Uh, in other words, it's not a matter of being in a, in a rural location where community water service doesn't make sense. It's just impractical to extend water lines over miles and miles to pick up a few houses. Um, instead, I'm gonna be talking about a situation where um, the geography of these communities relying on private well water really would suggest that they should be connected to a city or town system that's very close by um, due to the high population density, but they're not connected to such a system. Um, due to historical factors that I'll, I'll get into. And I first became aware of this, these kinds of communities back in 2009 uh, when I was in North Carolina and was very fortunate to have the opportunity to have lunch with the newly appointed state health director, doc, Dr. Jeff Engel. And I was curious to know what his main priorities were in his new role. And I was really surprised to learn that one of his main priorities was uh, looking into issues of racial disparities in quality of, of water and sanitation services in the state. Specifically, uh, he described to me some co communities that were right on the border of city or town or encircled by it, but didn't have access to city and town water services. And he'd, he'd heard anecdotal reports of these kinds of communities, but really didn't have a good sense of the geography of them, you know, how many were there? Where were they? Um, were they facing any problems with their water quality? Was that impacting their health and what might be done about it? So that really was, it was that one lunch conversation that motivated all of this research. And I'll say part of the reason I was so interested is that when I was getting my master's degree in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Illinois, where Steve is located, and then later on continuing for my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, I really thought, like like many folks who grow up in in you know middle class towns in the U.S., that we've kind of solved most of our water and sanitation problems in the U.S. So I was really surprised to hear about um, the situation. I have to apologize. There's a lawnmower going right outside my office window, so I will try to speak up, and hopefully it will be done soon. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of background on these kinds of communities. Um, that rely on private wells, even though they are in close proximity to cities and towns. Here's a picture of the uh, one of the residents of one of the communities I work with. And in a moment, I'm going to show you a map that shows you exactly where that fire hydrant is. Um, behind uh, this resident of the community is, is a nice neighborhood in the town of Apex, fully served with municipal water and sewer service and all other municipal services. And Again, I'll tell you more about his community in a moment. So, um, but first a little bit of background. So why is it possible that you could have relatively densely populated neighborhoods in areas where municipal services really make sense be excluded from those services? And so 
To understand how this occurs, you need to understand the concept of extraterritorial jurisdictions, or ETJs. Under North Carolina law, any city or town can basically claim a zoning authority over territory up to three miles from its corporate boundaries. And this map here on the right is a map of all of those so-called ETJs across the state of North Carolina. What you see in the map is the colored areas are these ETJs. In the middle of the, each colored area, you can see there's a dot. That's like the white dot is the city or town. And they basically claim zoning authority over all this colored area outside the city or town boundaries. Here's Wake County, where I've done a lot of my work. Um, and you can see the, the large coverage of, of ETJs in Wake County with city of Raleigh here and some other uh, major cities over this way, Apex and Cary. Um, so in these ETJ areas, property owners don't have a say in whether the local town claims access to this land. They also don't get to vote in municipal elections, so they don't have any input into um, decisions that the, the town council might make about zoning in these areas. And because they're not officially incorporated into municipal boundaries, um, they don't have guaranteed access to municipal services. I'm going to pause for a minute while this lawnmower drives right up to my windows. We are having all kinds of technical problems this morning. Oh my goodness. Bad timing. So, almost done, I hope. Although it's the case that municipalities are not required to provide any of um, municipal services that are afforded to their town residents in these ETJs, in some cases they do elect to do so and extend sewer services into these ETJs. So not everybody living in one of these little colorful areas is relying on a private well, um, but some of them are. And my question was, having talked to Dr. Engel, does race make a difference in whether you get access to a community water system in these ETJ areas? So these colorful areas around the borders of cities and towns. And so coming back to this community, the Iron Gate Drive community, this is a map of the Iron Gate Drive community right here. Um, it is surrounded by Apex, North Carolina, a town of about 55,000, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs, it's a suburb of Raleigh, in this, the entire state of North Carolina, um, with a median household income of about $113,000. The household income at Iron Gate is less than half that. The What you can see is the orange indicates the racial composition or the shading. So the dark orange means this community is more than 75% black, the cream color in the surrounding areas of Apex, less than 24% black. Overall, the Iron Gate neighborhood is about 80% black, and the, the town of Apex is 8% uh, black. What you can see here is the town boundaries. Um, before I got started working with this community, the red lines are the town boundaries, and you can see they kind of run right up to the edge of Iron Gate. Here they are again, town boundaries. But Iron Gate is not incorporated into the town. Here's the fire hydrant right here that you can see Mr. Lassiter standing in front of. And then all the blue pipes are water lines for, for the town of Apex that are serving these surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so I wanted to mention that in this community, my first thought was, wow, you've got these closely spaced parcels. Every one of them has their own private well and their own septic system. Uh, residents told me the soil doesn't perk well, so kind of environmental engineering 101 is you don't want to dispose of your waste uh, unsafely right next to your drinking water source. So I was initially really concerned about water quality, but com coming to work with the community then, I learned that they also were experiencing major problems with water quantity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just to keep this image in your mind, oh, there goes a lawnmower again. Hold on a moment. Um, 
to keep this image in your mind, this third parcel right here, or you know, the second one, sorry, this, um, these residents had just paid $10,000 when I met them to drill a deeper well, and it still was turning up dry. So they had, had no running water into their home. And they were actually having to haul water um, and store it in a big plastic container in their garage. And um, there was an elderly lady who lived over here, and she said she didn't have enough water to take showers. And meanwhile, because this fire hydrant is a dead end on the apex uh, water system to preserve water quality periodically the city would flush open the hydrant and just flush the, the, the tap here and this is in this direction is downhill so the water all this clean fresh water would go rushing down iron gate drive right past these homes where folks don't have any water in some cases or not enough water for activities of daily living um, in other cases so that's that's kind of the picture and the question, again, that the health director had, he hadn't heard about Iron Gate. Um, they got in touch with me later, but he'd heard of other similar communities around the state and, again, wanted to know, is this a really big problem? Um, you know, are these sort of isolated cases? And is there really a role of race in, in who has access to water services? So I began trying to answer the question, and I was really surprised to learn that there was no statewide database or national database that indicated accurately at the residential parcel scale who had and didn't have a connection to a community water supply and a community sewer system. Um, up until, many of you know this, um, but I was surprised to learn it at the time, the 1990 census included questions about water sources, uh, including this question, it, it, it included do you get your water from a public system, such as a city water department, a private company, an individual drilled well, an individual dug well, or some other source, such as a spring, creek, river, cistern, et cetera? And there was a, a similar question about sanitation service, but this question, unfortunately, was eliminated after 1990. And I found that water utilities aren't willing to share, typically, their addresses of their residential customers they'll share service area boundaries that often are overly inclusive. So they, they might indicate, for example, that they serve an entire county, even though there are pockets within the county that aren't served. So it turned out to be much more challenging to, to document the extent of this kind of problem than I thought it would be. But I learned after many phone calls to the counties around the state that some counties include water and sanitation service data with their residential tax parcel records and that they, they can make those available. So two of those counties are Wake County, which I where Iron Gate is. Again, it's the location of Raleigh, the state capital, largest county by population in the state. Oops. And then Halifax County, which is a very different sort of county. So Wake County is very wealthy, population of a million, 72% white. Uh, median income is 81,000. Halifax County is a very different sort of county. It's a small county with just 50,000 residents. Uh, it's majority black, 40% white, and a much lower median income, $26,000 um, than, than Wake County. So again, these two counties are um, among the very few that collect these data on what levels of, of water and sanitation service are available at each residential parcel. Um, so, so I kind of began my research here. Um, so here's a, another map of Wake County. And the first thing that my students and I did working with a group of students um, was to obtain residential tax parcel data for a number of years for Wake County and overlay that with municipal boundaries and extraterritorial jurisdiction boundaries and also racial composition. So what I'm showing here is, oops, this color-coded map, the yellow, all areas in yellow are within a city or town, and therefore they have access to the community services, including water service and sanitation service. All areas in gray are rural areas. They're not ETJs, they're not part of the town. Um, and so we're not focusing on those. The areas that we're focusing on are all of the areas that are not yellow and not gray, 
and those are the extraterritorial jurisdictions. The areas in light blue, the residential parcels in those areas do have access to a community water system that's regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. All of the parcels in salmon and red do not have access. And this map, if we were to zoom in on it, you'll see interesting patterns like some of these extraterritorial jurisdictions without water, like little little teeny islands in the midst of, of a city right over here, uh, you know, over here, over here, over here. It's a, it's a really unusual spatial pattern. And so very quickly, it didn't take much analysis to quickly reveal a pattern that if you look at the proportion of households in a given census block that have a connection to a community water system, and that's that's here, what proportion of houses in the census block in these extraterritorial jurisdictions have connection to a community water service? And if you look at this by uh, population proportion, um, it turns out that there is a significant trend that the higher the um, proportion of African Americans in the population, the less likely a resident of one of those census blocks in an extraterritorial jurisdiction is to have community water service. Um, so the lowest levels of service are in the areas that are essentially mostly African American. Um, we found a similar trend in Halifax County. Again, this is the proportion of the population in a census block in the extraterritorial jurisdictions of the county that's black. And then this is the proportion or the, the odds actually of having water service. So again, there's this declining trend. Um, so it's interesting, the major uh, towns in Halifax are actually majority white. So very different pattern, but the same kind of trend, the same apparent influence of, of race. Why is this so? Uh, I found out as I was doing research that a group of demographers and sociologists has been looking at issues of how municipal boundaries were drawn in the South throughout history. And they've developed this term called underbounding, which they basically define as um, areas that geographically really should be incorporated within the city or town, but they're not. Um, and they've documented this pattern again of that, that black communities are less likely to be incorporated into a city or town than are similarly situated white communities. And um, this is just a quote from an article by one of the sociologists who's looked into this issue, the article from 2007. And he says that the reason the cities don't annex these, these predominantly black areas is because this may unsettle the racial balance of power within local municipalities. So, you know, that's kind of the historic uh, reasoning behind this. And, and, and this is really kind of a legacy of, of racially restrictive zoning policies that occurred in the past, but, but the legacy still remains. Um, so we did document that there does appear to be a role of race in who has and doesn't have access to a city water supply in these extraterritorial jurisdictions. And therefore, again, these folks are relying on private wells. So we begin then to look at what does the water quality look like in these neighborhoods? And what, if any, health issues do these communities face because of problems with their water? And so we recruited households throughout Wake County for testing. Here's my student Frank again with another one of our participants um, in her kitchen. And this is a map showing locations of where we conducted tests. This is a similar map to the one I showed you before except in this case, yellow means these are areas that don't have water service that are in extraterritorial jurisdiction. So again, we recruited from a number of these areas, oops, throughout Wake County, and we tested them for microbiological quality and also for lead, uh, because those are kind of like, you know, baselines for public health. Public health and environmental engineering 101 is you don't want people exposed to fecal pathogens in their drinking water. Um, so therefore, we looked at microbial contaminants. And of course, around the time we were sampling, Flint was really in the news where there had been a failure of corrosion control by the municipal water system. And we wanted to see 
um, because these households are relying on private wells and from what we could tell, not practicing corrosion control, we wanted to see what uh, was going on with their lead um, in their water. So um, these are pictures of some of my students, some undergrads. We, we didn't have much money at doing this research back at the time. So a bunch of undergrads volunteered to help. And there they are conducting bacterial uh, water quality analyses. And here's Frank again with in the in, um, UNC Biomarkers Mass Spec Lab getting ready to analyze some samples for lead. And so fast forward to the results. What this chart is showing is we tested for three different indicators of potential fecal contamination of the water, total coliforms, E. coli, and enterococcus. And we compared these uh, results to data that the city collected on uh, microbiological quality of its water. And the city only collects water on, or data on total coliforms and E. coli, not enterococcus. But the bottom line is that occurrence of these fecal indicators was quite common in the private wells that we looked at. About 65% of them had detectable concentrations of at least one of these. Um, and the ones that are especially of concern, of course, would be Enterococcus and E. coli, both of which are strong markers of the potential for, for fecal contamination. Um, as I mentioned, we also tested households for lead, and we found that 28% of households had first draw lead concentrations that were above the EPA action level of 15 parts per billion. So this is a histogram. So among the participants, 20 had lead levels below 15 parts per billion and nine had lead levels above 15 parts per billion. And again, Flint was really in the news at the time we were doing this research. So I thought, well, let's see, how does this compare to what's going on in Flint? And this is from a paper by Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha reporting on the water crisis in Flint. And these data from her paper indicate uh, the results of water testing for lead during the water crisis in this column. And this should be percentage of samples having more than 15 parts per billion of lead. So you can see throughout Flint, these are the nine wards of Flint, anywhere from six to 32% of houses had lead above 15 parts per billion. The, the three that are in the box here are the ones that were most affected. And in our analyses, again, we found that 28% of the sample houses, sampled houses had high lead. So that was really comparable to what was going on in Flint. Um, and then we were able to get from the North Carolina Division of Public Health access to um, routine health surveillance data for two different outcomes. One was emergency department visits for acute gastrointestinal illness for specific disease codes that have been used in other studies of uh, to try to calculate the waterborne fraction of, of AGI. Um, and then we were also able to get blood lead surveillance data for 60,000 children in Wake County and look at and see if there were differences in blood lead between the children in the county with private well water versus community water systems. And then further look at the role of extraterritorial jurisdiction. So I won't spend time on this. This work is published in the American Journal of Public Health if you want details, but we estimated that about 22% of the cases of, of a very acute gastrointestinal illness sufficiently severe to send people to the emergency department could be attributable to the microbial contaminants that we were observing in these private wells. Um, this is a different sort of chart. This is also published um, in 2020 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And this is showing the influence of water source and a whole bunch of other variables on children's blood lead levels. So this is like fractional change. So as you move up this way, blood lead levels are increasing. As you move down this way, they're decreasing among these 60,000 children. And what you can see is if you compare the children with access to community water system to those on private wells, those on private wells have about a 25% increased blood lead concentrations um, when they're tested. And this is even when we control for all the other things. These are all the controls in our model. So blood lead levels are lower in children who live in newer houses because of course lead based paint, based paint was banned in 1978. So Again, this is the oldest houses. As you get into newer and newer houses, blood lead levels decline. Um, 
Blood lead levels also decline with income and, and income here is represented by the value of the home. So as the value of the home goes up, blood lead goes down. Interesting was that in extraterritorial jurisdictions, this is right here, blood lead levels were higher. So there seems to be in these ETJ communities a role of water and potentially a role of some other lead sources. Um, and then most recently, um, I got to thinking that I wonder if this early life lead exposure for these kids could be leading to outcomes that we can actually measure as they mature. And so we were able to get from the North Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice records of any reports of juvenile for ju juvenile delinquency against all of the kids in our database who reached at least, least age 14 um, uh, during the period in, in which we have available data. So that was about 14,000 kids. And again, the, you know, the sort of our hypothesis was that relying on a private well, if there's no corrosion control, would lead to increased risks of lead leaching from plumbing and well components leading to increased lead exposure. We'd already shown that, but we know that early life exposure to lead causes can cause cognitive damage that can be irreversible. And other studies have associated this cognitive damage with actually increased risk of criminal activity later in life. Um, this chart is showing, um, it's a bit complicated, so we'll just start over here. And I think I accidentally left off the key, so I, I'll explain it to you. But what this is showing is, this is the probability of a, of a child, a boy, between ages 14 and 16, being reported for a juvenile complaint issue or having a juvenile complaint record against them. The solid blue line is for black children in Wake County who rely on private well water. The dashed line is our prediction of, of what this would look like if these children were able to switch to the nearest community water system in, in Wake County. And then um, this is for, for white children. So the, the blue is for black children. And of course, you know, there are terrible racial inequities in our justice system, and that's what this reflects. But what it also shows is that white children also would, would benefit, you know, from what we can see from our matching of blood lead data to water source and juvenile justice outcomes, that white children also would benefit from a lower risk of juvenile delinquency if they had water with lead levels that were um, equivalent to what's um, provided in the community water services available in Wake County. Um, so this is for any complaint for boys. This is for serious complaints, such as ones involving violence and you know, slightly even bigger gap here for boys. And then this is equivalent information for girls. So overall, girls are much less likely to be reported for juvenile delinquency than, than boys. You can see the maximum here is 28% versus 11% for girls. But again, you know, the girls appear to be at, at risk associated with early life exposure to lead from well water. Um, so this was also published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just this past January, if anybody wants details. Um, and I, I did mention the issue of water shortages in the Iron Gate community. And so I thought I'd say a little bit more about that, which is here's some survey results from Iron Gate. 60% um, of, of residents told us that more than once a year, they didn't have enough water. Their wells did not produce enough water. 5% um, said once a year, their wells didn't produce enough water. And 15% said once every few years, they didn't have enough water. Only 20% of residents had reliable water access year round. Um, this is a picture of, of a gentleman who lives in another one of these ETJ communities in North Carolina, actually in Chapel Hill. And I went to visit him and he, he wanted to show me as well. And it's underneath this tarp and then a pile of blankets, because what happens to him is if his well freezes or his well components freeze and pipes burst, it takes him a while to save up enough to be able to make repairs. And so when this happens, he actually has to haul water from the local gas station. And meanwhile, the, you know, the, the town water supply for the city of Chapel Hill is just down the street. So um, we asked people about what do they kind of give up when they don't have enough water. Of course, folks said they didn't take showers. They didn't do laundry at home. They had to rely on bottled water, you know, limited toilet flushing um, and so on. 
And I, you know, I got to thinking, we actually did this survey just before the pandemic broke out. And, you know, I thought like this, these problems of not having enough water could carry additional risks due to lack of ability to, to wash hands and bathe at home, um, which increases your risk of transmitting pandemic disease, of course. Um, so then we also, I, communities have told me, we don't just want to know we have a problem. We want to know what we can do about it. And so for water quality, a solution, of course, is water filters, household water filters. And so one of my students, Riley Mulhern, for his PhD dissertation, recruited 18 households to participate in a study of a low-cost under-sink granular activated carbon filter for removing lead. And he also looked at, at PFAS contaminants and microbiological quality of the water. And he paired that up with a, a little ultraviolet disinfection device. So this is just kind of a diagram of his sample setup. He collected samples of the water before it went into the GAC system at the outlet of the GAC system, but before the water went into the UV disinfection system. And then at the, the outlet of the UV system and then here at the tap to see what was going on and whether these would work. And a big question was whether these would last. Um, you know, how long they would last. The advertised lifetime was six months. So he original plan was to test for six months, but the pandemic hit. So he ended up running the study for eight months with a, a small delay in the middle. Of course, a longer term solution that's not practical for many well owners is to extend municipal water service. But in the kinds of communities where I've worked, this is practical. There's a picture of some water mains being delivered. Um, and I'll tell you about that study in a moment. Um, so here is just a snapshot of Riley's results looking at what happened to lead in the water that was flowing into people's filters who participated in this study over approximately an eight month period. So this is time zero. And this is, you know, during one month, during the second month, third month, fourth month, fifth month, and then the pandemic hit and he was, wasn't able to go back to people's houses for a little while. So there's going back uh, as the pandemic began to settle down a little bit. And what you can see here in pink, these are actually lead concentrations measured um, at the tap at the beginning of the project before any filters were installed. And then these are lead measurements um, in the unfiltered water flowing into the GAC unit and in the, the water flowing out um, of the tap. So. Um, one thing that's interesting here is that what he observed is lead levels were highest at this time zero. And that's because what we just determined is that a lot of the lead was coming from the faucets themselves. So if you notice going forward in the study, the levels are lower um, because the samples were collected from water that was flowing into the GAC unit and before the tap. But the good news was that these filters were able to consistently maintain very low levels of lead, non-detectable in almost all instances throughout this study, which again ended up running for eight months. So the, the turquoise is basically the effluent from the filter. Sorry, I, I thought I said tap, but this is actually the effluent from the filter. So they were highly effective. Um, but again, there were concerns about microbiological quality of the water. And unfortunately, the UV system is, was an experimental system and probably didn't quite have the disinfection capacity we were looking for. Um, and so this is just showing some pictures of um, culture of samples collected um, and tested for um, uh, heterotrophic plate counts, I believe is what these were. In the raw water flowing into the GAC filters, in the water flowing right out of the GAC filter, and then after the water went through the, the UV system. And what you can see is, there was real change in the microbial composition of this water. Um, on the other hand, working with a, a microbiologist, Riley was able to do genetic analysis and determine that the, you know, these were not pathogens basically. So the water didn't become more hazardous uh, from a pathogen exposure standpoint, but it also wasn't effectively disinfected. And we think that there more needs to be understood about these changes in the composition of the microbial community um, and, and what that might mean for human health. Another problem that occurred in some houses is that sometimes the filters clogged. Um, 
And of course, you know, one problem with filters, we all know that folks with private wells don't always maintain their systems. And imagine if you add a filter onto the, the mix, um, there could be problems with long-term maintenance. So we also tested, and I'll wrap up here, um, the Iron Gate community, one of the best things that ever happened in my professional life is that we were able to help them collect data that ultimately convinced the town of Apex that they really needed water service into Iron Gate and that was able to also convince the county to um, basically reallocate a community development block grant to, to pay for a lot of the costs. So one of my students, April Desclos, and her daughter ran a study. Um, happened that this coincided with the, the pandemic. But anyway, um, the, the community was connected to the Apex water supply on May 20th. Not everybody could afford to connect because houses had to pay an $1,800 upfront connection fee plus a plumber. Um, but some of the houses did connect. And April's master's thesis was to look at what happened to um, the quality of the water from in houses that connected from before the connection to after. And also how did houses, how did their quality compare to those that didn't connect? Um, and this is the res bottom line result of statistical analysis, which basically connecting to the city water decreased the lead that was coming out of the kitchen faucet by about 74%. She also did an experiment among houses that hadn't connected and all houses before they connected to see if you flush the tap um, for two minutes, what would the effect be? And, and that reduced lead levels by about 40%, but wasn't as effective as connecting to the city water. And this is just a picture of a celebration with the community here at a restaurant after the town agreed to extend water service. And this is April, it's not a very good picture, but again, she did this research during the pandemic and we had a community report back event in a park masked um, so that nobody would be put at risk. Like I said, um, the major barrier for this kind of solution is, of course, costs, even in this community, which is right next to the water line, extending water mains is very costly. It was about a quarter million dollars for the town. And then the residents had to pay a one-time connection fee plus pay a plumber. And of course, in rural areas, this isn't a practical solution at all. Um, so I'll just jump ahead to the summary and I apologize for taking a little bit too long, but our work did really show that there are these pockets of well owners that are living in areas where they're densely populated enough that really they should have city water service. In these particular communities, perhaps because of the population densities and other factors, at least in Wake County, there are increased risks of exposure to lead and bacterial contaminants, potentially others as well um, in the drinking water. We've associated those exposures with short and long-term health effects. And you know there, there are technical solutions available to solve this problem. And thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jackie, that's great. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Someone asked, um, yeah. these are, you know, it's basically, there was a comment more uh, related to your sampling inside the home. So it's a plumbing issue is in related instead of a, a quote well issue. And I guess mm -hmm. if you want to speak to that, it, you know, I, I have my own opinion there, but. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, the thing is, um, it is a well issue in the sense that if you've got corrosive water and you don't practice corrosion control, then you're at increased risk from lead. That's yeah. actually what happened in Flint corrosion control failed, right? They, they, they kind of let it go <laughs> um, after the city went bankrupt. So it is an issue of, of well water in the sense that if people don't have corrosion, can practice corrosion control and they don't know to test their water for lead, then, you know, they're going to be exposed. Uh, well, and I think standing Flint up as an example uh, doesn't really work because it was human failure there. And there are yes. many, many communities around the country who have lead pipes and have no lead issues exactly. because their water's not corrupt, and they have scale yeah. buildup instead and deal with those issues. So you need to understand the chemistry and what's causing that to really get into those issues. You know, we tell people that um, if they have a chance to get on city water, it's it, it can save them a lot of that responsibility of testing right. their water and understanding if it's safe or not. And um, I think that's where that, go that goes. Um, someone asked if there's a link to the full report um, I'm assuming you can provide that to us and we can uh, put that in the notes. 
Absolutely. Um, a heap of and certainly, um, let's see, do any of these systems have plan to extend water service in light of all the federal funding for water infrastructure? I mean, I guess that gets to um, other areas you've identified that might uh, be in the same boat. Yes, great question. I have been so fortunate because the former director of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality has been a longtime mentor and he's introduced me to the, the new secretary and she has been on the phone with me asking me for recommendations of other communities that are in need. You know, they're facing the same challenge I did, which is how to identify these communities. We're, we're in that same boat as well. We, um, yeah, so, okay. Um, we need to move on. And if anybody has any other questions, I'm sure Jackie's going to hang around and she can monitor the chat and uh, and get involved in the discussion. Um, I think we aren't going to solve the question of whether it's better to have well water or public water. Um, and there's people who have their own opinions. Um, what we find is there's a lot of folks who aren't, um, pro a lot of well owners who don't understand their well well enough or have the resources to maintain and do the things you need to do if you're going to have your own well. And so for those folks, it's probably better if they're on city water. So um, yeah, great presentation.